presentation will be online, two presentations will be have been recorded and will be broadcasted. So let's start with our first speakers, which is Tim Klingenberg, PhD candidate at Ruhr University of Who, who's going to talk about neurotic landscapes of Santiago, Southern Slovenia, seeing, hearing, and questions of operation. In uh, team, I hope okay. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to respect, if possible, the 15 minutes speaking times, and then we have the QA sessions at the end of these four presentations. Thank you, team. The floor is yours. Right. Thank you. I'm just gonna make sure everybody sees my uh, presentation slides real quick. Um, yes. just gonna double. Okay. I'm just gonna double check. Does it change? Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you on the behalf of my colleague Maria Zabo and me for uh, giving us the opportunity to present our project and uh, our PhD project. So I'm going to introduce or give a short overview of two of our PhD projects. Um, so it's going to be as follows, a short introduction to Santa Antioquia itself, then my PhD project, which is seeing and hearing and then um, Marie's project, which is neurotic practices and questions of appropriation. The island of Santa Antioco in the west of Sardinia is well known for its Phoenician and Punic heritage at the harvest town of Soch, which is on the top left here. It's important uh, within the wider Mediterranean network has been profoundly assessed through research of the last decades in comparison our knowledge about earlier periods is still extremely superficial, although the amount of neuragic monuments is comparatively high. Since 2017, the Making Landscape project, led by Professor Constance von Rudin, is investigating the prehistoric settlement system and perception of the land and seascapes through annual fieldwork campaigns, excavations, and several EA and MA theses have been written. Currently, my colleague Maria and I uh, are the two PhD candidates incorporated in this project. On the island of Santa Antioquia, according to local citizens, as well as previous investigations, are about 90 different constructions dating to various time periods. The sheer number of structures offers a good basis for comparison between buildings such as Nuraghs, giant's tombs, or fonts and wells, and their spatial distribution. This enables the possibility to formulate research questions regarding the perception of the prehistoric landscape and how such a perception might have been influenced by these constructions. Up to now, the focus of my PhD project has been on the Nuraghs of Santa Antioquia. For the analysis of the sensual, which means visual and acoustical cognition, and the interweaving between the audibility and visibility, the comparison between the simulation and approximation as well as real world experiences are paramount. Therefore, I describe my impressions that, have, that I have experienced while visiting the Nuraj constructions and complement them by computer generated GIS models. Here on the left hand and right hand side, you can see me actually uh, trying to get to the monuments through the vast and dense vegetation of the island. Furthermore, through these analyses, it might be possible to find answers to questions regarding the possible social political organizations, such as different means of control. For this approach, I try to employ a phenomenological approach towards the landscape, for instance, like Ingalls dwelling in a landscape. Based on this theoretical approach, the real world experiences are documented in two ways. One is the visibility, which includes the description of the neurotic structures, and the other one is the acoustic. I am aware of the fact that the sites and therefore my perception of the current landscape differs from the impressions of the prehistoric people that were dwelling within this landscape. To account for this, I'm applying different parameters for the calculations, for instance, a mean value for height uh, to all of the towers I've visited. So the towers, have a height range between 13 to 18 meters in height. And I'm taking my height, which is one meter, 70 centimeters, as well as a 15 meter average for the towers, which uh, calculates to 16.7 meters in height for the visibility analysis on the computer. The acoustic analysis, 
are carried out by two people. One person walks 50 meters up to 200 in all four cardinal directions. And then the two try to communicate or interact with each other while one person remains on the construction itself, like me sitting here documenting the landscape and uh, the tower itself. With regard to the interaction documentation, the sensory perceptions were recorded in three different groupings. For the auditory sensory grouping, the following were defined, audible, perceptible, and no acoustic stimulus. Up to now, the sound propagation has been done by means of quote unquote normal communication, which means uh, a conversation ranging from 40 to 60 decibel and sh uh, shouting, which is above 80 decibel. For the future, I hope to teach myself whistling similar to uh, the whistling language of Gomera, uh, as this impulse of whistling can be perceived above further distances and is less prone to diminish over longer, uh, longer stretches. The field of view analysis were also carried out in consultation with the second person. Both people describe the landscape, which means from a near to a far distance and a full 360 degree circle. And after, the, after that, these impressions are written down separately and the two documenters talk and discuss uh, the things they've seen or not seen or what struck one person as important or noteworthy within the landscape to give an impression of the attempted, attempted phenomenological approach. In addition to that, the neuragic structures are documented in regard to their type. So there are different types. I'm not gonna mention every single type, um, but from the middle to the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age, these change from rather simplistic to a more complex system. Um, by sketch and a 3D photogrammetry model. Uh, I've brought with me an area of photography here, which I've uh, conducted with, uh, by a drone flying a sketch I fabricated and a 3D model. The digitalization is done back here in Bochum where the constructions are drawn in a proper scale, which means for these constructions, one to 50 or a one to 100 uh, scale, as well as the analysis of visibility and audibility are computed in a GIS program to compare the experience with the computer data. At this stage, we have found two divergent patterns of orientation from the towers, one facing the sea and the coastline, while the other faces towards the hinterland. The, on the left-hand side is the entire uh, visibility or view shed analysis for all the towers, and marked in white are the three examples I brought me, with me for uh, the coastline, as well as possible harbor sites. On the right-hand side is uh, a single view shed in pinkish, and on the bottom right side is the uh, sound propagation. The reddish yellow one is uh, the normal means of communication, which uh, 40 to 60 decibel, and the cyan to neon pink is the shouting. Um, In contrast to the sea-facing Naragi, numerous structures were found around and in the Kanai Plain, whose audiovisual reconstruction suggested an orientation towards this very plain, um, which can be seen here. That this is the so-called Kanai Plain, and all of the towers are mostly facing inwards. On the right-hand side, I've brought an example with me, which is so-called Naragi Sapruna. On the top, again, the visibility and on the bottom, again, the audibility. It could be, uh, it can be concluded from this that uh, virtually every point or place within the plane could be seen from the surrounding buildings. And thus it was possible to check which people were at certain places at certain times on and were, for instance, working or uh, traversing the landscape. Furthermore, it could be established during these analysis, that the sites were located at a distance between one to three kilometers from each other, which is about the same distance that changes in movement are recognizable to the human eye. This can be taken as an indication that the people of the Bronze Age were not necessarily different groups 
but potentially belong to a single community. Another consideration based on the distance between these structures is that a rapid form of communication might have been carried a lot, uh, out along these tops. This consideration is based again on the overlapping acoustic fields of the audiovisual analysis. To connect the buildings, their location, as well as the outreach or perception with the daily activities in the prehistoric Kanaikin, my colleague Maria Zadl looks at the pottery from the Naragic site of Grotiaqua. For this purpose, the comparison of the pottery is seen as a product of decisions based on the knowledge of contextualization of the environment, which means the perception of the landscape. The previous petrographic studies show the use of different local raw materials as, uh, as the non-plastic inclusions match the volcanic rocks surrounding the plain. Here I have uh, a map from Marie, which gives us an example of different types of uh, rocks and uh, non-plastic volcanic inclusions. Um, the fabrics show no trace of extensive processing or the addition of temper. Therefore, we believe that the diversity of, of compositions is caused by the exploitation of various clay deposits. Through a raw material survey conducted in 2020, we were able to confirm a wide availability of clay sediments in and around the Kanai Plain in so far as almost every sediment is plastic enough to form small vessels. Nonetheless, there are clear differences found uh, in quality by marine. The limestone hills on the eastern coast, here located in green, close to the proposed harbour site of Maladroja, for example, are surrounded by sediments rich in limestone and calcite inclusions. Those show lime spalling when fired with higher temperatures, which can lead to the disintegration of the whole vessel depending on the amount of limestone that can be seen in the middle as well as on the right hand side in the test clays that have been prepared and fired by Marie. In fact, there were uh, there is very little evidence for the use of calcite-rich clays in Grotti Aqua so far. This disregard might have had technological reasons, but also the proximity to the coast and the sea far, uh, facing Naragi should be kept in mind, since the sediments could have easily been processed by levig levigation and fired to higher temperatures. On the other hand, we can already confirm the use of clays related to the rheolithic units surrounding the site of Grotiaqua, here marked in green. Um, and the hills to the west, which is shown as mentioned before in the uh, X-ray diffraction graph. Uh, they were not only used for vessels, but also for architectural elements. The distance is significantly smaller, but only a small part of the region with these clays can be seen from the known constructions. However, the area is connected to a giant's tomb as well uh, as wells, which would have been frequently visited by a larger part of the community on a regular basis. Another interesting observation was that the alluvial sediments from the plain itself show a very good quality and are easy to work without much preparation. The exploitation of these resources for pottery production was likely connected to other activities like agriculture, where a direct interaction with the soil takes place and knowledge about its properties is common. If the plain was something like a community land seen and shared by many groups, the access to resources for pottery production is likely to have been shared as well. Thus far, the computed and real-world central perception seem to confirm the two aforementioned patterns and orientation, one facing towards the hinterland and the plain, and one facing outwards towards the sea and coastline, while the acquisition of resources appears to follow the same underlying organization. In the research to come, we both aim to analyze the presented topics in finer detail. For example, integrating the other construction types mentioned before for the central analysis and integrating larger, a larger sample size of pottery for the analysis of raw materials. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Tim. And stay there. We will have hopefully a lot of questions for you. Let's move to the second speaker who sent us the recorded version of. Okay. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Inki Kiriat. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Niki Kiriaku. I am a PhD candidate at the Department of History and Archaeology. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Niki Kiriaku. I am a PhD candidate at the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Cyprus. And I'm really happy to participate in FORMAC and uh, uh, present my work to all of you. Uh, today, I will present part of my uh, work for my doctoral thesis titled The Coating the Rural Landscape of Late Antique Cyprus, Fourth to mid 7th centuries AD, uh, which is uh, mainly a GIS approach. The outline of my presentation is some historical and archaeological background. Uh, the objectives of my research, the methodological approach, the current stage of my research, a case study that I have included in my thesis, and following steps. Uh, starting with the, some basic historical context, the chronological framework of my research is Late Antique Cyprus, from 4th to mid 7th centuries AD. In mid 4th century, Salamis, renamed Constantia, succeeded uh, Paphos in becoming the capital of Cyprus. A key fact during the 5th century, uh, the Church of Cyprus uh, gained its autocephaly. During the 6th to 7th centuries AD, the island evidenced a significant prosperity and wealth. Uh, the integration of the island in the Vestura Exercitus in the 6th century and the fact that the island was not uh, occupied by a Persian invasion provided tremendous advantages for the economy and trade of the island. The island's strategic and commercial importance as a resource of fields, crops, pottery, and cover increased for the empire as uh, the surrounding uh, sources of these uh, goods, Egypt, Palestine, and Syria, were lost to the Arabs. The economy of late Roman Cyprus in late antiquity was a thriving economy, well integrated within the economic network of the empire, based on the exploitation of copper mines, agricultural lands, fiber, ceramic production and trade. Uh, it must be underlined that uh, Cyprus occupied an important place in the production and exchange networks of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, in mid 7th century, the Arabs invaded uh, the island. However, it seems that uh, life seemed to uh, continue on the island. A bit of an archaeological context on the urban centers of the island in late antiquity. Cyprus, like uh, the other provinces of the empire, hosted a number of cities cities, mainly of them, mainly uh, coastal ones, 
located on the coast, but uh, some cities were identified uh, inland. Uh, there are references to the existence of other cities, that other sites that uh, might have also functioned as uh, cities, uh, like uh, Trimithus and Lydra. Most of the coastal cities were equipped with public and private buildings, like theatres, baths, forms and villas, and monumental basilicas illustrating a flourishing economy. The urban centers derived their wealth from their immediate uh, countryside, and the cities were responsible for the administration of their hora. In terms of the periphery, the hora of the urban centers, uh, along with these thriving cities, the exploitation of the Cypriot countryside throughout uh, the centuries was phenomenal. phenomenal. Uh, a dynamic growth and abundance of rural sites is noticed, is noticed during this period. Sub substantial villages, coastal towns and farmsteads, pottery workshops and other industrial installations seem to be uh, uh, appear in the archaeological context. Uh, the growth of the rural settlements was accompanied by the con construction of uh, basilicas, uh, revealing the establishment and penetration of the new religion into the countryside as well. In late antiquity, Cyprus evidenced a transformation of rural life, a demographic and an economic expansion. Uh, some key facts for late antique Cyprus the island's integration in a larger economic system provides a useful context for understanding the uh, return of urban prosperity and expansion of rural settlement during the antiquity. Cyprus occupied a key role in the production and exchange networks of the Eastern Mediterranean, and many parts of this Cypriot countryside were well integrated into the economy of uh, of the empire. As elsewhere across the Mediterranean, uh, the rural landscape of Cyprus must be viewed as part of a continuous settlement uh, system, a provincial landscape whose urban and rural features were inextractable from the web of the empire. So more farmsteads, villas, agricultural villages, mid-sized commercial harbors formed a matrix of smaller settlements that existed within the peripheries of the urban centers and had a place within the broad regional systems of exchange. The current uh, research aims to address a gap in research. Uh, in the last decades, the archaeological uh, interest on late antique Cyprus was shifted, has shifted from the study of urban centers to the rural landscape of the island. Many archaeological surveys emerged, identifying numerous rural sites, relieving, revealing a busy countryside throughout the period. Both through excavation and survey data, uh, Uh, the excavation and the survey data identified in urban and rural contexts are mainly quantified and interpreted separately and rarely evaluated uh, as integral elements of a common framework, the social and economic landscape of Cyprus. The corpus of published and unpublished archaeological material is enormous, however, a comprehensive study and interpretation of the remains in their historical, social, cultural, economic, and environmental context is still missing. The research object objectives of my uh, research 
is to identify the socio socioeconomic role and function of rural sites located in the whole of urban centers, propose possible site hierarchies and webs of interconnected rural sites and their functions within wider rural urban settlement networks in the social, economic, administrative and religious landscape of the island and provide a comprehensive study of the rural landscape of late antique Cyprus, integrate all available data. The specific research objectives of the research is to investigate the association of rural sites with environmental and geographical variables and other archaeological sites to analyze the role and function of rural sites within their environmental, topographical and archaeological context, identify potential settlement patterns, hierarchies and webs of sites, and provide a comprehensive temporal study of the evolution of the settlement activity in the countryside. Recognize the approximate periphery of uh, urban centers, and examine the role of rural sites within the whole of urban centers. And lastly, identify possible rural and urban networks. The methodological approach followed is firstly the collection and digitization of all archaeological data dated uh, in uh, 4th to 7th seven, centuries. Uh, through in-situ visits and survey where necessary, and uh, mainly bibliographical and archival research. Integrate all relevant data in a database and a GIS environment. Conduct GIS and statistical analysis of the data in relation to the environmental geographical variables and the relation to other archaeological remains in order to identify uh, their function within the rural context. GIS and statistical analysis for the approximate rural territory assigned to each urban center in order to analyze the role of the rural sites within this context and conduct network analysis of possible rural urban clusters, webs, and hierarchies. The suggested types of spatial analysis are cost surface analysis, least cost paths, visibility, network analysis, and further statistical analysis that will reveal some trends and will further explore the results uh, retrieved by the GIS analysis mentioned above. A temporal approach will be followed, illustrated the continuity and change throughout the centuries. Uh, the results generated by GIS will be interpreted in relation always to the historical, social, economic, cultural and religious context of the island. The proposed integrated methodology will attempt, attempt to generate a comprehensive model which will find applications in reconstructing and interpreting the socioeconomic dimension of the cities in the current state of the research. Uh, the archaeological field survey conducted on the island were reviewed and evaluated. Um, I believe that I have concentrated all the surveys that uh, deal with the late antique uh, sites. You can uh, view a map of the archaeological uh, surveys that have identified late antiquity sites. Um, I have conducted a, a review of uh, similar uh, applications in GIS applications in archaeology and I have designed my methodology according to uh, the bibliography and the case of Cyprus.
and have conducted an extensive uh, review of the topographical and, and environmental variables of the island, mainly based on data retrieved by the Geological Survey Department of Cyprus. Uh, I have uh, uh, compiled an extensive database of uh, sites that include uh, the name, date, uh, type, um, of uh, and coordinates, and many other uh, information on the sites um, and any other type of remains, meaning the road networks, milestones, and uh, inscriptions, and any other data that are dated in uh, in the specific chronological span. I have digitized most of these uh, data taken from uh, maps owned by the Department of Antiquities, by aerial images, and by bibliographical uh, research. And I have transformed this data in uh, GIS uh, layers. Uh, again, this data we are taken uh, by uh, published uh, uh, and unpublished uh, surveys were digitized and uh, were visualized in GIS environments. Here you can see the, surveys, the survey areas and the sites that uh, uh, they are dated uh, from 4th to mid 7th centuries. I have uh, uh, visualized uh, this data in GIS environment and I have uh, done an initial, initial GIS analysis uh, to see the uh, relation of these uh, sites and other types of uh, uh, data like the road network in relation to uh, other, their proximity to the road network, uh, to the arable land, to uh, hydrological uh, areas, their proximity to the urban centers, the picture on your right uh, illustrates the proximity of these sites to um, Lapithos. In this case, in relation to uh, the copper, uh, the pillow lavas, relation again to rivers or arable land and, and water. Initial analysis was uh, done for all the the urban centers to visualize the rural sites proximity to the urban center, to the road network, to other rural, rural sites, and to place these uh, sites uh, within a walking distance from the urban centers they possibly belong to. Too. Uh, again, uh, some uh, images uh, showing um, the relation of the sites, not only uh, uh, farmsteads or villages, but also basilicas, uh, the relation to the urban center, the road network, other sites, and uh, the coast. And uh, I'm sorry, these are just some pre preliminary results that must be further explored by statistical analysis. Uh, apart from the secondary research, uh, this case study, this uh, thesis has conducted also preliminary research using the Denyakaki area 
This uh, survey was conducted in collaboration with PhD candidate Cristal Loizu and with uh, the support and collaboration of uh, our supervisor, some professor uh, Athanasios Vionis. Uh, we have conducted a survey in the Denyak Aki area, mainly concentrating in the uh, uh, already known archaeological sites and in the buffer zone. Our main interest was around Agios Perniakos, the Bronchet Cemetery and the Gagi Pigadia. These are already known sites and we have conducted extensive and intensive survey around these areas. Um, it was considered necessary since my research is mainly based on secondary data to undertake a primary research by conducting a small-scale archaeological survey, survey to further complement the corpus of data collected through other resources. The survey was conducted in 2016 the periphery of villages of Akaki and Denia, and the same very aim to map all sites uh, located in the periphery of the villages and study the evolution of rural landscape and settlement activity in the area uh, in more chronological periods. Uh, the survey of the two villages add significant information to the overall map of late antique Cyprus. There is significant existence of significant building complex in Agaki, the Basilica of Agios Perniakos, and all these elements indicate a flourishing rural uh, and community. Uh, the proposed uh, research uh, focuses on the distribution of the material dating on the 4th to 7th centuries and intends to interpret the distribution of rural sites and their function in the Mesauria Valley within the broader socio-economic framework of late antiquity. Uh, the fact that uh, this large area is part of the buffer zone makes this case study even more interesting and because minimal exploitation and mainly of some minor agricultural activities took place from 1974 onwards and uh, preserving the character of the area uh, uh, rather um, um, there, there is minimal uh, human intervention in uh, the area. Uh, these are some views from Ayos Perniakos to Mesoria Valley, apparently a strategic uh, uh, point uh, looking towards the fertile uh, Mesoria Valley and its rivers. The next step is to uh, conduct further uh, analysis of the material collected from Bernia, from Ayos Berniakos, conduct various GIS analysis on our case study, and analyze the data from Denia Agaki uh, to identify uh, not only the sites that were occupied during late antiquity, but their role within the broader in the, uh, context of uh, Cyprus and uh, uh, understand the role of this community within the broader framework of Cyprus and the empire. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry that I am not able to uh, take any questions, but please feel free to email me anytime or contact me for further uh, clarifications. Thank you, everyone. Okay, let's move quickly to the next speaker who should be online. Yes, it's perfect. Um,
Costas Papagiannopoulos, PhD candidate at the University of Cyprus, Latimento Evolution and Land Use in West Arkea, testing the Frankish period dynamics. Thank you, Costas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, just a moment. So you can see the presentation. We saw it. we see your screen just you can make it full. Ah, this one. Okay. It's okay now. Not yet. Uh, Could you try stop sharing and resharing? Um, yes, I have a new then. You can see the um, not. Yes, I have um, it is okay. Would you try we share your screen then? Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Try the full mo screen mode. Okay, I. You Not can yet. see the full mode. No. Not yet. Not yet. I don't know why. Okay, L let's keep it this way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Kostas Papagianopoulos, and uh, my research project in the framework of my PhD dissertation uh, examines the settlement evolution in the area of Patras, Western Greece, from the late antiquity till the end of the 19th century. My aim is to examine the residential development in the specific microenvironment over a sufficient length of time so as to understand the process of origin, growth and decline of local communities and settlements while simultaneously monitoring the economic and social or other conditions that interact with uh, human perception and behavior, leading to specific or differentiated choices. Drawing on the surface survey of the Western Nakaya, both uh, extensive and intensive, as its starting point, and through the application of landscape archaeology methods and approaches, I will investigate the factors that caused the boom and bust cycles in the course of the time. This long period is poorly studied in Western Achaia, in contrast to other regions of the Greek world. However, we now have at our disposal a sufficient number of uh, historical, archaeological, and environmental data to give us a comprehensive approach to our research questions. This data, which is uh, currently being processed uh, by our ceramic experts, Professor Athanasio Dionis, Dr. Evangelia Daffy, and Dr. Philip Bess, will help us to represent and understand the changes in the historical landscape. Costa, Costa. Anna, you, 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 have you changed your uh, slides? Uh, because we still see your uh, very first slide. The first slide, eh? 
Are you still on the first or have you changed it? Είσαι ακόμα στην πρώτη διαφάνεια, γιατί εμείς λέμε... Ναι, ναι, ναι. Εντάξει. Όχι, είμαι στη τρίτη διαφάνεια, δυστυχώς. Εντάξει. Κάνε... κάνε... Βγες από το uh, full screen mode. Εντάξει. Και δείξε μας το PowerPoint σου συνέχισε να μας το δείχνεις όπως χωρίς full screen mode, γιατί κάτι πάει λάθος. Οκ. This one. Περιμένουμε. Ναι, θα, θα το βλέπουμε έτσι, εντάξει. Εμείς το βλέπουμε okay. το βλέπουμε okay. έτσι ούτως ή άλλως. Okay, okay. Οκ, okay, yeah. okay, 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 right. um, this... okay, uh, I said that uh, this data is currently being processed by our ceramic expert, Professor Thanasio Vionis, Dr. Evangelia Duffy, and uh, Dr. Dr. Phil Bess, and they will help us to represent and understand the changes uh, in the historical landscape, the use of space, the spatial distribution of uh, available resources, and the urban-rural relations, communication and uh, trade networks. Their processing uh, will be facilitated uh, by the use of geographical information systems, uh, which effectively help in the construction of databases, in the analysis of special data, and in their visualization through dynamic maps. Patras and uh, uh, its uh, region constitute one of uh, the important regional nodes of the Eastern Mediterranean from Roman to modern times. So the study of uh, Western Achaia in this long period will shed light on the slow but uh, perceptible processes in an area that is until now a terra incognita for historical archaeological research and will complement our knowledge on the formation of the Mediterranean landscape. At the same time, this study is added to the few similar studies in the Greek area that have a holistic approach to a landscape and microspace in the long term. The best studied period until now is uh, the Frankish period, which is lasted from 13th century to middle 15th century. In particular, the material, mainly pottery, which is relatively easily identifiable, has been described, dated, and to a large extent drawn. Very helpful was the material from kiln debris, which offered a satisfactory basis uh, of comparison. The data have been digitized and distribution maps have been generated. The analysis is done at two levels at the barony level and at the fifth level. The role of castles is examined and an attempt is made to determine the extent of a fifth. This work I'm going to present here very briefly. According to the Morea Chronics and information from documentary sources, the area of Patras in the early 13th century was divided in two or three baronies, which were subdivided in 37 fifths. The presence of a castle suggests the existence of a fifth in the area, whose administrative center was in the castle. Various sources dating from between the 13th and 15th centuries mentions 23, sorry, Yes, 23 castles or towers situated in this area, which are generally considered to be Frankish constructions. Nowadays, only 17 of them can be accurately identified and positioned on the map. Notably, uh, the area to the west up until the borders of Ilia is omitted in both the Frankish list lists and the early Ottoman records. An explanation could be that um, um, uh, it was covered by forest, as is known to have been the case from the 17th 
to the 19th century. This would account for the scarcity of files in the fieldwork work there. Anyway, it seems that not all the fifths contain castles. The specific position of every castle is useful in defining its catchment area and uh, consequently roughly determining the extent of the corresponding fifth. The fact uh, that not all the fifths contain castles is not very helpful. Therefore, uh, Thyssen polygon based estimates have some practical value in places where castles are densely located, as is uh, the case uh, northeast of Patras. Here uh, in the Saric, uh, the mean area of three polygons is 24.3 square kilometers. Near the same figure uh, we arrive if we consider the whole study area, excluding much of the western plain and the mountainous zone. Viewed analysis uh, was used to show what can be seen from the Loki of Towers and whether Frankish castles formed a network of uh, intervisible landmarks. As you can see, um, um, a series of assumptions was adopted here. Let's see here. Okay. Um, half, uh, the results are the following. Half of the castles do not view and are not viewed by others. Two castles that are situated at a distance of one kilometer only are not uh, visible from each other. Therefore, there seems to be no network uh, of uh, intervisibility between the castles. Nevertheless, each castle was able to observe the surrounding line, parts of which uh, might be identif identified as the realm of their respective fifth. Consequently, the castles in the area of Patras operated as uh, local hubs for uh, administrative services, tax collection, and harvest storage safeguarded by small garrisons. They were concurrently symbol, symbols of power and reinforced the, the legitimization of social inequalities and control over the local population. The main tower was normally used as a ruling residence, surrounding by other buildings serving various functions in a rather confident space, including a system. Cost-surface analysis in the case of Castle of Kamenica offers an additional way, both for quantifying land tenure issues and modeling human special behaviors and decisions. The Piros River, as you can see, uh, left and the top, the Piros River was the central feature around which revolved a wide range of local activities, a potential source of various benefits, and probably the main reason for setting up a separate entity there. After all, as can be seen from the said analysis, the village turns its back on the coast and is oriented towards the river. Nevertheless, it seems that the river was a major obstacle in past human activities in the area of Kamenica, especially in the winter when it burst its banks, and it might also be perceived as a kind of natural barrier, at least towards the west. The time required to reach periods there close to its mouth would be almost uh, 45 minutes and to cross the river just less than an hour. Therefore, uh, the fifth boundaries uh, seem to have fluctuated between 45 to 60 minutes 
from the village of Kamenica, including an area with a mean of 32.8 square kilometers. Using old community boundaries as a guide, the area included within a 45-minute timeline coincides roughly with that of three villages, that is Kamenica, Tergano, and Bedroni, as they are outlined in a 17th century Venetian map. The same area was split into five administrative units at the beginning of the 20th century. This area is about 21 square kilometers. Then, if we continue to the 60-minute timeline to include the part of Tsukala and of the community of Katoakaya, where the salt pans or aliques of Kamenitsa mentioned in the early Ottoman archives were situated, the area extends too far to the south and probably enters the area of the neighboring castle of Postena. If we move instead to the 60-minute timeline on the east-west axis only, then the area will reach 26.5 square kilometers. Nevertheless, by taking into consideration both the formation from the early Ottoman registers and the 17th century community boundaries, the area of the fifth is estimated to be about 28 to 30 square kilometers. Then the main pre-Frankish settlement in Kamenica was gradually abandoned, while another one near the castle was established or expanded. Uh, nothing is directly known about the fifth resources. However, Kamenica is mentioned in the archives of Ragusa, present Dubrovnik, in the first half of the 15th century as a non wheat trained area. This further implies that a kind of harbor may, might have existed somewhere, as simple as that described in a Portland of the mid 16th century, that is, in the mouth of the Piros River which was then navigated by small river vessels. According to the Ottoman archives, most of the production, as you see in the right hand, uh, came from well-irrigated places near the village within a maximum of thir uh, 30 minutes on foot. Close to the edges of the, this zone were situated two mills and three pottery kilns. The rest of the area was devoted to cereal production. So, to conclude, as feudal estates became centers of government, surplus production and trading activities, the reorganization of the countryside in the area of Patras and the foundation of many of the modern villages took place within the Frankish period. Our data from the area of Patras depict a long period of prosperity until the mid 14th century at the earliest. Thank you and sorry for this presentation. Thank you very much, Constantinos. In could you stop sharing your screen so that we can play the video? We have Cristalla Lotz, who she sent us the, a video with a presentation titled Rural Settlement Dynamics in Medieval Cyprus. Okay,
Hello to everyone. First, I would like to thank the organizers of this forum and I am really sorry that I cannot be there and present my paper in real time. Let's start. The dynamic landscape of Cyprus constitutes the ground of many diverse civilizations since antiquity thanks to the advantageous and strategic location of the island as a nodal point for trade and communication in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the late 11th and 12th centuries, the island was a province of the Byzantine Empire and experienced a period of prosperity. However, the local population, affected by the division of the island's lands and estates, peasant rebellions due to the heavy taxation and the development of monasteries as landowners. In 1191, Richard the Lionheart, conquest of Cyprus, marked the beginning of the long period of Latin domination on the island. The interaction between Latins and Cyprians on Cyprus occurred with the context of an administrative transformation which included the establishment of a Western feudal system. Thus, the aim of this paper is to elucidate the complex nature of the rural landscape of Cyprus from the Middle Byzantine period to the end of Frankish domination. In the framework of my doctoral dissertation, supervised by Dr. Athanasium Vionis in the postgraduate program Byzantine Studies and the Latin East at the University of Cyprus, a systematic archaeological survey survey was conducted in the wider region of the modern villages of Denia and Akaki. Although the project adopts a diachronic approach, this presentation deals with the period between the 12th and the 15th centuries. More specifically, it focuses on the examination of the distribution of surface material evidence, the estimation of ceramic densities, and the chronology of diagnostic search. Through the analysis, an attempt will be made to reconstruct the dynamics of the settlement through the surface ceramic evidence. The selection of the area of interest, as well as the design of the systematic surface survey, are based on various archaeological, historical, and geographical parameters. More specifically, a key factor for the selection of the region is its placement at the western part of the fertile plain of Mesauria between the mountain range of Pedadactylus and Trodos. It is worth mentioning that the area of interest is part of the so-called buffer zone that was established in 1974 after the Turkish invasion. Also of a great importance is the fact that three archaeological sites have been discovered within the area of interest. The first one is an extensive ancient cemetery found on the hill around the modern village of Denia. The second one is the multi-periodic site of Agios Perniakos, about two kilometers west of Denia, on a small hill within the plain. Finally, the third site is a rural villa decorated with Levis mosaic pavements excavated at the site Pigadia, close to the modern village of Akaki. A range of informed methods, methods of intensive field survey has employed it, such as the systematic counting and collection of surface material evidence, mainly pottery, through a group of walker, walkers spaced at equal distances from each other, lined up within tragic units of 50 by 50 meters or within existing fields, and shown in the cadastral maps. Additional factors, such as the restrictive measures imposed by the United Nations, the military trench, the dense vegetation in some places, and the modern human activity, were taken into account in the design of the project. Starting with the area around Denia, a concentration of surface ceramics dating to the 12th century was identified north of the low slope where the mosque is located. The material is composed mostly of shirts 
that belong to different types of domestic glaze pottery, as well as to chafing dish and storage vessels. This small ceramic assemblage of the 12th century from Denia seems to form a, disti a distinct nucleus in pottery density, indicate human presence at the site before the arrival of France. Higher density and more extensive pottery distribution can be observed in following centuries. More specifically, survey evidence has been discovered in the same area as well as east of the modern village under the rocky outcrop. The ceramic material spans a wide chronological spectrum ranging from the 13th to the late 16th century and contains fragments of domestic glazeware, storage and transport vessels and cooking pots. As shown in the graph, there is an increase in the percentage of medieval pottery dating from 13th to 16th centuries compared to the pottery of the Byzantine era. A closer look at the medieval ceramic assemblage from Denia suggests that a small group of serfs can be dated to the period of Frankish rule between the 13th and the beginning of 15th century on the basis of published comparable material. A second and more numerous group of pottery is dated to the Venetian period between the late 15th and 16th centuries. It is worth noting that the administrative change between the Frankish and the Venetian period did not have a radical impact on the ceramic production on the island. For this reason, a large part of the finds can be dated to the transition between the periods during the second half of the 15th century onwards. Finally, a third group, consisting of a significant number of certs, mainly storage and transport vessels, due to the lack of diagnostic features and the similar technological and other characteristics of the pottery, can generally be dated to a wide chronological spectrum between the 13th and 16th centuries. The number and the distribution of medieval pottery at Denia give the impressions of, of a more intense human activity during the period of Frankish and Venetian rule, compared to the Byzantine era. The ceramic evidence discussed above suggests that the existence of a rural settlement at the site from the 13th century on. The analysis of surface material demonstrates an important peak in settlement's history from the middle 15th century. It is worth mentioning that Denia is not recorded as a fief or a state during the period of Frankish rule in a writing source. However, maps dating to the 16th and 17th century refer the villages of Denia as Degri and Degra. On a low hill about 2 km west of Denia, within the buffer zone, is situated the church and the top of Agios Perniakos. Topographical maps refer to this area as Kyoroglu, accompanied by the indication Agiasma holy water. The site was selected at second survey zone and has intensively surveyed due to the importance of the architectural remains that came to the light from the excavation of the Department of Antiquities. Transects running east-west plotted throughout the lower slopes of the hill that overlooks the plain of Mesauria. North, northeast of the excavated site, a limited concentration of surface ceramics was discovered, while pottery density appears to be zero to the east. More specifically, a small group of certs can be dated to the 12th century and belong to glazed pottery within size and paint decoration. A significant increase in the percentage of the surface ceramics can be seen between the 13th and the 16th century, as have been observed in the case of Denia. Fragments of pottery dating to the period of the Frankish rule, such as cooking pots and domestic glaze wares, have been identified. Regarding to the period of the Venetian rule, it is interesting to note that the most of the ceramic certs are dated during the second half of the 15th century. 
The results of the examination of the survey assemblage fit well with the picture derived from the architectural remains that came to the light of the site. As suggested by the surface pottery collected, the site was in use in the 12th century and continued to exist well into the medieval period until at least the 16th century. The discovery of an apse from a church dating to the 12th century and a single ale chapel of the 16th century in relation to the earlier traces of church complex in the 7th-8th centuries lead to the hypothesis that a religious center existed at this site. It's quite reasonable to assume that it's function as a site of pilgrimage on the island. This view is further supported by oral tradition and topographical maps that connect this burial monument with holy water, a yasma, visited by many pilgrims for the cure of skin diseases. However, various types of ceramics, such as storage vessels, cooking pots, and table glazewares, do not preclude the existence of settlement with their facilities, which were associated with the role played by the religious complex in the rural landscape. Finally, the site Pigadia, close to the modern village of Akaki, was selected as the third survey zone. A large building, possible a rural villa, dated to the 4th century onwards and decorated with lavish mosaic pavements, is being excavated. The investigation of surface ceramics saw a total absence of the 12th century material. Instead, a sparse density and extensive distribution of shirts dated between the 13th and 16th century identified it. The highest pottery concentration of this period was found along the riverbed, which is located north of the excavation. This fact, in combination with the picture of sparse concentration of ceramics in an extensive area, may not reflect the core of a residential activity. Instead, it can be interpreted as a random accumulation of archaeological material from the river deposits and or as the west of an herby settlement. The latter could have been at the location of the modern village of Akaki, which used this area as cultivable, cultivable land. However, there are notable mentions in the writing sources of the period about Akaki. The Chronicle of Amadi refers Akaki as Kazal of the nobleman Balian II of Ibelin, priest of Galilee in the 13th century, while Leontius Maheras records the royal family had applicum in the village from the Latin word applicum, which means residence. In maps dating to the 16th century, it is marked as Akachi. The survey zones discussed above belong to a wider region which is characterized by the existence of rivers. More specifically, the Serahi River flows northwest through the Morphe Plain. Its coursing waters connect with a number of smaller rivers in the west part of Mesauria Plain, being Merica River, Akaki River, Peristerona River, and just before it reaches the sea, the Ovgo River. These river valleys offer rich soils for agriculture, which constitute the core of the economic system of the medieval period in Cyprus. They also provide areas suitable for habitation. As the written sources inform us, the region was divided into fiefs. The Frankish rulers established the feudal system as they were accustomed to in their respective countries of origin in order to organize the agriculture and economic exploitation of the extensive rural landscape. However, archaeological evidence is scattered and fragmentary and mainly limited to churches. This is because the modern settlements are built over the medieval residential course. Starting with Peristerona, the settlement is attested since the 11th century as evidenced by the large multi dome 3 a basilica. Furthermore, Leontius Macheras and Florio Bustron 
refers to the village by its present name. Avlona is mentioned as a fief of a certain Pierre Empolo, while the single A domed church of Agios Georgios in the area is dated to the late 14th century. Finally, Menico Kokinotrumithia Paleometocho Agitrimithias are recorded only by written sources as settlements that belong to fiefs. To sum up, the archaeological material offers some indication of human activity in the area during the 11th century, but it's difficult to assess the settlement pattern of this period. During the following centuries and in the Frankish period, the localized environmental advantages of, the Cypriot, of this Cypriot landscape were fully exploited by the inhabitants as supported by archaeological material and the written sources. The picture about settlements during this period between 13th and 15th centuries emerging through the analysis of evidence suggests a busy countryside with important human activity. Based on geographical site analysis, which assesses the land quality and natural resources on the surroundings, it becomes apparent there is a consistent association between settlement, best quality land, and herbid water supply. The vast majority of the sites are located along the banks of the river valleys, closely connected with the most productive zones. Thank you. Okay, so let's have the quickest QA session ever because I've been told that in five minutes we need to have our have so sort of. Minutes. Okay, so anyway, we have two speakers to ask question to. So, is anything coming from the audience, the online, or the one in presence? Any questions? Okay, I'll start because I do have questions. I would like to ask. Team and Costas, if can they turn on their cameras? No, we will share it. It's maybe on the screen. Still on the screen. Okay, and let's share our camera. Okay, so my first question is for Team. Uh, that's very interesting, your presentation. I was wondering, because um, you know that there's a lot of critique around viewshed analysis and everything about the soundscape, especially because the soundscape doesn't have a solid methodology behind. If you consider that the landscape might have been pretty different back in times, and especially for the soundscape, there are a lot of, you know, uh, variables that belong to the land coverage and that presence of woodland. So are you thinking about exploring this variability, source of variability? Um, so, um, well, if in the real world experience, uh, the land cover is, I cannot change that, but uh, we have lighter data. So mm -hmm. I reconstructed my, um, my DM via the lighter data and uh, our, uh, Archaeobotanist is currently researching our uh, prehistoric environmental samples. And what I try to do is then reconstruct an approximation of a prehistoric land cover. And um, the GIS tool, or I use factors in land cover. So it, it needs land cover and mm -hmm. a, a specific definition of land cover where urban streets and shrub vegetation and all kinds of vegetation have to be put in mm -hmm. um, and classified. And it also factors in humidity, wind, uh, temperature. And exactly. So it, the, the tool itself or the algorithm factors that in. And this is why the sound propagation looks different every time I do mm -hmm. an analysis. So I'm, and I'm trying, and I write that down or I write down my own impressions mm -hmm. and, uh, to be as close as phenomenological as I can while being still being, oh, there is no true, well, I, I can't be objective entirely because these are my impressions, but what I can do is give people the opportunity to do that themselves. Okay, thank you, thank you. And is there any question for Costas? 
from the audience, the one at Aro or those online? No, okay, no. Okay, I I'll go with, with my question to Costas. Um, you have presented the, 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 the Frankish period uh, landscape and especially using different techniques, TIS and polygons as well as surface, you have identified your area of research. Can you tell us more about how these help us for understanding what is the contribution of, for understanding the hierarchy within the society and the society into its own landscape? So the castle, the villages and all the different you know, contributions of the socioeconomic landscape. Thank you. Turn your microphone on. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, I will try to share again uh, my screen uh, in order to Speaking. indicate some. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Share. Ah, okay. This one. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Can you see this slide? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, the presence of a social hierarchy, even in the countryside, uh, was evident in the case of the castle of uh, Fostena. Uh, uh, but uh, we suppose from uh, the few documents and uh, uh, that uh, it also existed uh, in, pl in other places in Achaia. Uh, every fifth had um, its um, owner and a number of subordinates um, that uh, called the uh, homines, Vasalia and Vilani. Um, Vilani were the peasants uh, who cultivated the lands uh, of the fifth keeper. Uh, homines and Vasali were uh, lesser landowners, uh, Franks or uh, Greeks, uh, granting the part of the fifth, which was farmed by a few peasants. peasants. Uh, the difference in their social background uh, um, uh, was in their social background and the extent of their uh, property. Most of the Villani, uh, lived around the castle and uh, worked uh, in the, their lord's fields, uh, as well as in their personal holdings, the Stasias. Um, this is why we found, um, I, I'm trying to see, you see here, um, small pottery scatters up to 10 pieces uh, in different spots, beyond the castles, usually marked by a chapel. Here, you see here, 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 here. Um, in the village of Kamenica, which is here, um, it seems that the main habitation area uh, was around the church of St. Luke uh, the Evangelist. Uh, the dedication was very rare in the, on the Greek mainland in the early middle Byzantine period. And um, I think that um, this possibly suggests a Western Christian uh, dedication, church dedication, and implies that a group of uh, Franks lived there. Um, the, this church is here where this concentration is. And um, uh, the, then uh, there are two hygienes um, at the edges of the modern village towards the east and west, uh, here and here, um, indicate that um, uh, two different, probably orthodox neighborhoods um, uh, existing within the village. Beyond the village limits, um, dense pottery scatters uh, in small sites uh, can be regarded as uh, traces marking the lands which belong to second and third rate uh, 
members of the local social hierarchy, uh, equivalent to Byzantine agridia. Uh, these uh, were probably granted uh, uh, the these uh, members granted uh, their land from the fifth keeper. Thank you, Kostas. Thank you for your very extensive answer. Um, let's be back, let's enjoy our lunch and be back at 20 minutes past two online. Thank you to the speakers and the audience. See you later. Thank you.